recording live from Glory Hole Studios in Chicago and beyond. This is Cognitive Dissonance. Every episode we blast anyone who gets in our way. We bring critical thinking, skepticism, and irreverence to any topic that makes the news, makes it big, or makes us mad. It's skeptical, it's political, and there is no welcome at. This is episode 644, and we are joined today by Dr. Alice. And we asked Dr. Alice, how do you want to be introduced? She said, oh, I don't, I don't know. And then she's like, well, Merseyside skeptics, <laughs> and then Skeptic Magazine, and also QED. So just, just a few projects, Cecil. And I, I do, I do want to point out I pronounced things. that properly. <laughs> you raise your hand way too often to do stuff, right. to volunteer for stuff. Basically, <laughs> you've, you've got it like you got to do the like it's like it's like sitting in the uh, airplane and everyone's walking by and you don't want them to sit there. You got to like avert your gaze when they call for volunteers. <laughs> get silent. Tie a shoe. You just got to You just got to get good at picking up your phone at the right time. Right. And look at, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I got a oh, man. Really important I gotta, text. I got to take this. Yeah, I got to take this call. <laughs> Hang on a minute. I know my screen is blank. <laughs> Thanks for joining thank us today. Thank you so much. We appreciate you coming oh, on. Thanks for having me. It was wonderful to meet you in person. What was it? Five, six years ago? Oh my God, ago? it's so long, It man. must have been ages ago yeah. because yeah. it wasn't the last QED because I wasn't there. It was the one before, yeah. yeah. So it was yeah. It's five been years a, ago. It's been a while. It's six years. I was, I think Are you was, guys coming this year? Oh, we can't make it, can't this, do it year. this year. This, is, oh, this no. has been a tough year for us, but we are planning on coming back to QED eventually. Oh, absolutely. Of all the conventions that we've ever been to, I think QED Love sets it. the highest bar for not only content, stuff that you can you know really dig your teeth into, amazing speakers, fun nights to hang out, but the, just the, the atmosphere there that we had, I could not tell you how much fun I had. It, yeah. it, it, the city was fun. The people were fun. Great time. It was, everyone was welcoming. We had such a wonderful time and it was kind of thrown together at the last minute, but we had a blast out there. It was really great. Oh, that's great to hear. It was always good to hear good feedback about QED. Yeah. So you guys have got to be excited because this is like, I mean, this is the return. This is the this triumphant is the return. Of return. QED. <laughs> We, we've got to get it right this time to make sure that everybody, ha although to be fair, it's been so long coming that, um, that it could be terrible and people would love it, right? Low bar. <laughs> Low yeah. bar it, now. It, it will not be terrible. I promise it won't be terrible. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like COVID has set a, set a nice low standard. Like everyone's yeah. just going to show up in their pajamas, like <laughs> blinking heavily after crawling out of the dark and into the people sunlight have forgotten how to do social social lives people oh, have absolutely. forgotten what it's like to be in the real world uh, so it, it it'll be fun <laughs> <laughs> Get a bunch of nerds in a room apply alcohol failure to have communicated socially for two years or more yeah what could possibly what, go wrong? Yeah, this is, oh, it's a recipe for success I, this feels like from like H.G. Wells, like time machine. If it's just like all of a sudden, like the dudes from like underground just like crawl their way out, you know, and they're just <laughs> shots or whatever. Yeah, right. I forgot what they were called. It Morlocks. Is, there it is. Yeah. The Morlocks just like emerge into the sunlight, you know. <laughs> Outside, I, over under, how many undressed people in the bar by the end of the night? What's your bet? What's your bet? Because you know it's going to happen, right? Um, we, we probably are going to have to keep our eye on that. If there is any yeah. nakedness, we may have to ask people to um, uh, at least return their clothes. Yeah. Uh, we can't. I feel like <laughs> Heath is a solid one. For all of our guests. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it, with Heath and Eli there, though, guaranteed someone's getting their shirt taken off. Guaranteed. <laughs> Yeah. And then immediately put back on by a crowd <laughs> of onlookers. Just we'll get we'll get to the lineup of QED a little later. But we, you know we're so happy to have you here, Dr. Alice, to talk about some stuff. We want to talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about Britain's COVID response. Um, you know, we, we we when COVID hit, Tom and I, of course, you know, we sep we we live pretty far apart from each other. And when COVID hit, neither of us wanted to get each other sick, so we started you know recording from home and talking to each other a lot that way. And we just decided not to talk about COVID like at all on the show. We were yeah, like, you know what? It's, handful just, of weeks. It's, it's too much. Every week is a new COVID story. We just gave up. We were doing, you know, you like can't keep up to date, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, well that and <laughs> our response was so comically bad and terrifying that it was one of those things that like, like you're watching the world slip away. So you think, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't talk about this. Let's let other people <laughs> deal with how bad this is. So 
we just decided instead, you know, we're going to do man bite dog stories for like a whole year. Mm. We just, we just fucked <laughs> around. We found the dumbest stories you could yeah. find, you know, and we, 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 we ran with them, but we're curious, you know, from a perspective of, you know, uh, you know, rating it on one to 10 response, you were, you were, you know, in the middle of the UK during this, what do you think the UK did to try to stop COVID to try to help um, its citizens deal with that? What was, what do you think their response was? Uh, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> not quick enough, not fast enough, not bold enough. And um, we had loads of problems and we had the same thing, right? That we were recording a podcast and we always record um, in Marsh's back room. Marsh, you've had on the show before. Uh, everybody in Skeptics and Knows Marsh. Um, we were recording in his back office the three of us for Skeptics with a K, and we all got COVID um, before the first lockdown in the UK. Uh. Because by that point, there was so much COVID already in the country, uh -huh. and the, the UK government was in such denial that it was kind of refusing to do anything in terms of action. I think eventually they started to cancel some big public events, but, but far too late, there was a massive race uh, horse race event very early on in the pandemic that I definitely that. should yeah. have been cancelled. I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and and they then, were they were saying like, and I, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to clarify one quick question: weren't they like initially just like we're going to do herd immunity? We're cool with herd yeah. immunity. Herd, herd immunity. That's that's the solution. It's not that bad a disease. We'll just we'll just all get it, and then we'll all be fine. Which scientifically is just not how it works with these kinds of things, right? Scientifically, you want immunity because the vulnerable vulnerable people need protecting. And if you're just going to let it rip through your nation, then, then those vulnerable people are not protected. I, I love the idea that it is a radical notion to suggest that not getting sick is superior to getting sick. <laughs> it's right. remarkable. Why you just I don't, I don't like, say that out loud? You're just like, hey, which would be better to get sick? Yeah, that's that's over here. That's one. Or to now, hear me out. Not get yeah. sick. And people are like, no, there's a Hold hefty debate. A there's actually something away on both sides of dark. that. You're like, yeah, <laughs> what the fuck? No, there's not. When when the horse race was going on, could you bet on COVID to win or just place? <laughs> <laughs> It's going to win the triple crown. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just bonkers. I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but in the UK, like there's this big pride around going up to work when you're sick. Like you're like dying oh, yeah. in your office and oh. that's supposed to prove that you're really dedicated to your job. And it's like, you're getting everybody else sick. It's like, worse. It's awful. Yeah. It's, it's terrible here. <laughs> when, you know, so bad. I will say this though. In the last two years after COVID, um, I have noticed many people in my social circle, in my in my work circle that have called off and done things like, I'm, I'm sorry, I got a scratchy throat. I'm sorry, I got sniffles today. I'm just not going to come. You know, we can yeah. talk on the phone or whatever. That was not a thing, not for your social circle even. So if you right. had a cough yeah. at home, you'd be like, eh, I'm still going to go out to the bar. Or if you had, you know, the sniffles or you maybe had a little bit of a, like a headache, you'd be like, yeah, I'm going to say, if you're starting to feel sick, you got a cold, you're still going to go out with your friends to dinner. I, I recently, very recently, I was going over to a friend's house. And he called, he sent me a message in the morning. He said, you know what? My wife and I aren't feeling well today. We're just going to skip the thing tonight. You know, and they weren't, they said, I got a, I got a scratchy throat is what he said. He had COVID. Right. He, he canceled. He had COVID. No one wow. else got COVID. Yeah. He had, he and his wife dealt with COVID and then it was over. And like, I think that the last couple of years have taught people, at least in my social circle. Yeah. And my work, which is higher ed, which is totally not work, by the way. <laughs> that is not the same as regular, like, grind, grind, grind work. But it has taught people in my in my work that it's different. I literally just had to put out a missive to my employees the other day to stay home. If you, like, I'm, I'm like, I manage a, a group of people and I've got managers underneath me and they've got employees underneath them. So it's a fairly large group of people. At the beginning of this, I made it, I sent everybody home. There's only about eight or nine people that are in the office out of like a hundred. And so everybody has been home and they're going to stay home. And I closed my office and sublet it and it's all that. So, but every once in a while, they still have to get together in these small groups for meetings. And just like two weeks ago, one of my managers came in to meet with another manager and she's like, oh, it's just allergy. It wasn't allergies. It was COVID. And she <sighs> gave the other girl COVID. Oh. And I had to send out another message like, look, 
the boss, that's me, says stay home. <laughs> but it's so built into our culture. Yeah. That even exactly, when like yeah. even when the authority is like, stay home, it's cool. I don't want you to come to work when you're sick. They're just like, I should probably come to work when I'm sick. And you're like, no. Is it still <laughs> bad there? So we've just come out of quite a bad wave. We've had a bunch, and I had it for a second time just a couple of months oh, ago. No. Um, <laughs> so you can definitely catch it twice. Um, so we we were really fortunate at the beginning that we like we all got it and then we went into these lockdowns and we were all reasonably okay we we didn't get really really sick and then this second time around i just got it and, and a few other people i know and it was quite bad i think this variant's quite bad but that peak is now dropping and, and we're like oh it's dropping it's it's gone down to less than one in 15 people has covid but <laughs> yeah, that's like, unreal. there's still a lot of covid around right um and we're, we're now in the position where the government guidelines are, we recommend you stay home if you think you've got COVID, but we don't require it. You can go into work if you've got COVID. You can't tell if you've got COVID because you can't get any um, free tests anymore. They've removed the testing um, system entirely. So you now have to buy tests if you want to do Jesus tests. Christ. Um, so there's a bunch of people who are like, well, I've got a scratchy throat, but I can't stay away from work because I don't know if it's COVID. And there's no government guidance to say that I should stay home if I think I've got COVID really. It's is, just bonkers. Is there a, what was your vaccine rollout like? Is there, is there vaccines available? Are people getting multiple, multiple jabs? So that's the one thing we did. Well, there's a couple of things we did really well in the pandemic response. One was that um, there was this furlough scheme. So very early on when we went into those first um, nationwide lockdowns, people who could work from home or couldn't work from home but didn't need to be working could go onto this furlough scheme and they would get something like 80% of their salary would be covered and then their employers could just top up the rest. Um, so that was one good thing, one good pandemic response. And the other was we were shit hot at vaccines. We rolled out the vaccines really quickly. Our vaccine uptake rate was really high. There was obviously a lot of reluctance and there is a, a, an anti-vax issue in the UK, as I think there is everywhere in response to COVID. But pretty much, you know, everybody I know has been triple vaxxed already. We've had um, two vaccinations at the within close succession and then uh, a third booster. And I think we're now at a point where we're rolling out a fourth jab to people in vulnerable populations, yeah, elderly. Yeah, we did that um, here. What, so vaccines we're doing great at, but everything else. Yeah, yeah. What is, what is the NHS's um, take on the role of, let's say, Reiki, for example, <laughs> in the treatment of COVID. I have been reading a little bit about that. So how is their homeopathic response? Yeah, like, I mean, because we, it, I mean, obviously COVID is, is exacerbated by imbalanced uh, magic energies. Definitely, definitely, it definitely. Makes it so, I'm not saying it causes it, but it makes it worse. You wear a proper I mean, jade I think, amulet. I think, that's, okay. <laughs> yeah. I think that's why we got more sick the second time round, right? Because we're just, we're railing against the alternative medicine just, so much. <laughs> and it's just, our chakras are out of line. Um, we got really sick from COVID. That's, it's our own fault, really. Um so yeah, the NHS is currently ad or has been recently advertising for Reiki practitioners to work more in hospices and end of life care actually rather than COVID. And what's remarkable about the NHS is obviously there are little pockets of woo within the NHS that sure. are major problems and, and that we've been working as, a, as skeptical activists for years to try and bring down those numbers of, of things like that that are available to patients on the NHS because it offers that legitimacy to, to right. things that just don't work. Um, when it comes to COVID, though, um, I think the NHS has been pretty hot, apart from struggling with, you know, there being far too many cases for them to, to handle. Um, they've been evidence-led most of the way, and, and we've been very quickly shifting how we treat patients and trying to change how. So there was this thing fairly early on that we realized that actually it was really important for patients with COVID, particularly very strongly on their lungs, to be laid flat. So they were laid flat, I think, laid on the fronts to help them breathe for longer and keep them off ventilators as long as possible. And then not long after that, we introduced these um, steroid treatments that we know help quite well for people with COVID. So actually not too much woo in um, in the That's COVID great. response. That's and terrific. I actually, I really admire so many of the people who work in the NHS who've had this onslaught of 
anti-vaxxers coming in and telling and COVID deniers coming gone into the hospitals and complained at them for following treatment and said that their relative doesn't have COVID and that that they shouldn't be on a ventilator and all of these things that 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 may ultimately lead their family member to die. And the NHS staff have had to deal with that. They haven't paid any extra to deal with that abuse from from people. Um, Are overworked and underpaid and exhausted from running, working through loads of shifts when half their colleagues have got COVID as well. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. um, What about ivermectin? We had a big problem with ivermectin here in the States. People foregoing treatment from real doctors finding either, I I don't want to call it black market, but you know what I mean? Like ivermectin that was prescribed to someone else that they're doling out to other people or some types, some types of veterinary versions of ivermectin that they were taking instead of going to the hospital, people continuing to get sick, thinking that that was going to help them. Was ivermectin a big deal in the UK as much as it was here? It was definitely a thing. It was in, we had that little wave of ivermectin and the same with hydroxychloroquine, right? That Mm, that there was this wave of it being really popular and everybody talking about it. It seems to have disappeared. Um, I've not heard anybody talking about it more recently, but then I think it's become a lot easier to be a COVID denier now that we're pretending COVID doesn't exist. (laughs) 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 Oh no. That's we're all like, let's get back to normal and let's not do any pests. So yeah, people can yeah, say, yeah. oh, well, I've got a cough, I've got a tickle, but it's just flu or it's just a cold or it's just yeah. allergies or whatever. And and so they're not even thinking about taking alternative treatments for COVID because they don't believe they've got COVID half the time. Right. Yeah. Um, why, do, why do an alternative <laughs> treatment for something that isn't real? Like the CDC's <laughs> new guidance was just a shruggy emoji. Yeah. That was the... <laughs> 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 it's like, <laughs> like oh, just, just <laughs> yeah. I do what I want. <laughs> and this is it, right? That we've got no guidance on how to protect ourselves from COVID. So we're just we've gone in the UK, certainly, we've gone back to normal. People are not wearing masks in shops or on public transport or anything. They're socializing pretty much exactly as they were before, going to clubs, going to parties and things like that. Um it's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and we're not doing it. And, and I hold my hands up. I'm doing the same. I'm not wearing masks in shops anymore because you're the only person wearing a mask and it feels really uncomfortable. Um, I do occasionally pop one on, but it kind of feels like there's no point anymore because it's just everywhere, which, yeah, which no doesn't follow the science at all. Yeah, if no one's participating, it's really difficult. I will say, like, I live, uh, I live outside of Chicago, which is a pretty major city. And when I travel to downtown... I get on a, what they call a Metro train here, which is like a big sort of train that that's a commuter train that travels downtown. And there's, you know, many, many cars. And I would say about 25% of the people are, are masked. Jesus, only a 25% 25 of the people are masked. I'm one of those people. And then when I get, when I get on the L train downtown, which is the, the smaller commuter train that travels on a elevated track in Chicago, that's about maybe 35 to 40% of the people are masked. Oh um, it's a little because higher percentage, but it's not yeah, enough to protect people. We're at virtually zero here. Um, I, oh I will pop God. a mask on. If, I, if I'm on a commuter train, if it's it's in, I try not to travel at busy times because I think that's that's actually now, now people aren't taking that much care. That's the safest way right. to, to avoid getting it is just to avoid people as best sure. you can. Yeah. But if I do occasionally have to get on a very busy train, I will wear a mask for that reason and there might be three or four people in the carriage wearing wearing a mask even wow. if it's even if it's full to burst in um yeah it's that's in liverpool i think i went to london a few weeks a few months ago and that was a little higher actually um but there's more people there so yeah. <laughs> right right yeah, yeah. yeah I, I it's funny because like i i work in my basement i i like i'm just i'm i'm very isolated like my life is just very very locked down and isolated for a bunch of reasons but my kids, I, I took I took the kids to like the first day of school tour, you know, walk around, get your schedule. And like my family was wearing masks and we were the only, I think, I think we might've been the only people in that like high school, like a high, like yeah. the high school that the kids go to is huge. Like it is a massive high school. It is probably a few thousand kids. Yeah. A couple grand, right? Yeah. And like, there's no way that any of them are wearing masks at all. Yeah. And so I'm looking at that and I'm like, God, we haven't gotten it. And like, it's fucking everywhere right now. And like school has started and I know school just started this week. And I'm like, come on. Like the Omicron variant, 
uh, vaccines should be rolling out here within like four to five weeks. And I'm like, just not enough time. Yeah. Please don't yeah. bring this home. Like, yeah. oh, I don't leave yeah. my house, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And this is the thing is that it's just, it has got to a point where it's everywhere. And I, I get, one thing I get incredibly frustrated with is seeing people who will complain online or will brag online. Oh, I haven't, I haven't had it yet. And, and, and therefore I'm doing everything right. It's like, you no. can do everything right and it's you can get accident. it. Like, and the last time I got it, I was doing everything right. I've only been less uh, careful about masking since the last time I had it because sure. I kind of feel like, what's the point? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh. But I'm also very, very lucky that that I've had it twice yeah. and, and not had long right. COVID um, effects because, like, that's that's scary. The fact it that is. you can be yeah. sick for for a very long period of time um, what, afterwards. What I've been reading about long COVID is that is that vaccines really do help with the long COVID effects. Um, what kind of things do, you, do you, it, it, that might be something that you might know a little bit about? Do you know a little bit about the long COVID effects and if vaccines will help protect you? So I think there's evidence that vaccines can help. They don't they don't prevent it entirely. No, so no. if you if you are vaccinated and you get COVID, the COVID is less likely to be super severe, and you are less likely to get long COVID. So getting vaccinated is obviously very very important, but you are still at risk of getting long COVID, and and because so many people are getting um, infected, that means so many people are at risk of long COVID. And then as far as I can tell, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of uh, an idea of who's more likely to get it other than um, people with pre-existing uh, health conditions, um, which is fucking everybody, right? Everybody's right. got pre-existing right. health conditions. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. So... I have read some some interesting stuff on one way to prevent it, to try and prevent it, is if you get COVID, do fucking nothing. Relax. I have read the do same thing. Yeah. Nothing. Do like as little as possible and then do less than that um, for as long as possible until you're fully recovered. Because if you try to go back to, to doing normal stuff too soon, you're at greater risk of getting long COVID. So, but not everybody has the luxury to be able to take sure. 10 yeah. days off with COVID to sure. make sure they don't infect anybody and then rest for another yeah. two. Like it took me a month to recover from COVID last time. Oh my gosh. And I was fortunate that I could do nothing for a month. But yeah. obviously many, many people can't. Which means the people most at risk of COVID are the poor people who need to go out and work and, uh -huh. and can't switch off because Every time. they're on the bread line. Yeah, it turns, yeah. Out, it turns out that also working from home is also a very privileged thing that lots of people just can't partake in. They just can't do because they're in a position at work where they have to be at a place like you can't be a work from home mechanic. You know what I mean? You got to go to work. You've got to do the. You, know, you got to go to places. Cable service guys jobs, have to. Yeah. yeah, service job has to go there. Yeah. The, the supermarket they can't ring you up from home. You know they've got to be <laughs> in this place. And so it's a very privileged thing to think. You know everybody can just work from home. Nobody. I mean, it's, it's a small percentage of the popular the work yeah. workforce that can work from home. And then also you're right. You know the the people who have to turn around very quickly and go back to work are almost always people in poverty. It's, it's the worst. It's it. And it really is just, it's, it's like a, it's a disease that's just going to impact them way more than it impacts anyone else. It's just, it's a terrible yeah. thing. And that work ethic insanity that we were talking about before, like plays into that as well. Like here in the States, the standard like vacation package that you get in a good job with benefits. So like a lot of jobs don't have any paid vacation. Yeah. But the standard opening vacation package you get is two weeks off a year. So like if you use all of your vacation being sick, you bought two, you got two weeks off. So that's your time that's off. That's and after it, that, yeah. it's like coming out of your pocket. And that's if you're lucky enough to have yeah, paid the, vacation. The chances are, if you, and also too, coming out of your pocket is only if your boss will let you. Right, because some of them would yeah, just be like, look, like, you come man, back you to work, back or, to work or, or that's yeah. it. Yeah, you might yeah. be able to take FMLA, and if it's but FMLA is unpaid. Yeah, but if you're moving packages around or something, you're right. working hard. Like you said, it, working afterwards can be really detrimental. So that's terrible. Yeah. yeah. What uh, When it comes to uh, when it comes to vaccines, in the United States, we did okay, but there was a huge, there has been, I think for many years, an anti-vax population here. Um, they were relatively quiet, I think. You know, small groups of people, you know, you'd see little bursts of measles in certain places where the soccer moms forced their kids not to get measles shots, and then there'd be like little bursts of it. But it wasn't as bad as what we saw during COVID. Did you guys have leading up to, in the UK, did you have leading up to covid 
a strong anti-vax community or and did they get stronger when COVID hit? Yeah, so we're pretty much the same, right? But I think our anti there is an anti-vax population here. Thank you very much, Andrew Wakefield. Um, right? He was <laughs> what a our dick. fucking problem. What a fucking dick. <laughs> Fuck that guy. And One so, guy, man. <laughs> <laughs> and so I am in that generation where they vaxxed us for MMR, like at uni as well, to catch anybody who wasn't vaxxed right. as, as kids, because it was right in that in that little, um, that generation of people where there were a load of people who didn't get vaccinated. But a lot of that anti-vax sentiment had, it hadn't gone away at all. It definitely still existed. Um, and especially in areas where there's people coming from different countries. So, I think in particular, Italy has got quite a high anti-vax population. And obviously, if you're in an area that has a bunch of Italians move into the area, then um, then the children at schools can have low vaccination rates because of different conspiracy theories yeah. and beliefs right. yeah, yeah. of different cultures. Yeah. Um, but we definitely had an issue with with anti-vaxxers, but much small, smaller by comparison until, until the COVID um, pandemic. But I think... A big chunk of that is the conspiracy theory movement's just been growing for the last probably 15 years. And it was just bubbling to the surface right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic hits and we're having people locked down and, and having their their rights really infringed in, in lots of ways. If you're not allowed to leave your house, that is right. your rights have been have been infringed, whether you know it's for the greater good, but it still affects your right to to freedom um and and so the conspiracy theories just spiraled out of control during the pandemic that's so terrible it and you're is. right it, it really was sort of like everything sort of building up to one sort of perfect you know just all it took was one match to light that yeah. all on fire and and it you know it all hit at the wrong time you know hilariously enough maybe six months before the pandemic tom and i were talking about how terrible yeah. it would uh -huh. be to have Donald Trump as the president yep. when a pandemic hits or something big <laughs> like yeah, We said it on the show. Yeah. Like, can you imagine if something like that happens with this chuckle fucking charge? And then it was the leadership side here in the States was, and I don't want to exaggerate, but it was as bad as it could have been. Like, I don't actually think that it could have been worse yeah. at a leadership level here in the States. Did you encounter... Because, I mean, like, Trump openly, like, shit on vaccines and said insane stuff about sunlight and yeah, bleach. And fucking bleach in your veins. Took his and mask and off <laughs> as a show of, like, fucking dominance psycho. and alpha maleness or fucking whatever he was doing. Did you guys have the same, like, leadership doubts or leadership sowing of discord? We had leadership sowing of discord and doubts, not around vaccines, actually. So Boris Johnson, as much as I hate him <laughs> in every single way, he is he is terrible, um, just awful. As, yeah. as, as bad as Britain could have got for, for our pandemic response and like didn't turn up to the first bunch of COBRA meetings for the emergency meetings nice. when um, the That's pandemic first kicked off. Like, he the probably had hair appointment. That he just... He didn't. Well, he was on holiday for the first two. <laughs> <laughs> that's so insane. That is so Boris, though. I mean, that's so right. Boris. Come on, that that should be a show. <laughs> that's so Boris. <laughs> but because his pandemic response was so behind, and they 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 really didn't want to go into lockdowns and and destroy the economy in the way that lockdowns were predicted to do. Um, they put all their eggs in the vaccine back basket. So we were shit hot on vaccines and the messaging around right. vaccines was go get your vaccine. And they were really good on that. Less good on other messaging. So right at the beginning of the pandemic, Boris Johnson is wandering around shaking hands with people and acting like this is this is a reasonable thing to do. And then, of course, got COVID. Um, <laughs> was yeah. really sick. He's asking people <laughs> for a drink of their Coke. Right. He's just like, I mean, <laughs> what is happening, man? I mean, our guy literally said, this is nothing. It'll disappear like yeah. magic. Yeah. Yeah. Like he said, like <laughs> one day this will just disappear. He's like, it, he's like one like day magic. it'll just disappear. He's like, it'll just go away. And you're like, you don't know anything. You literally are the <laughs> stupidest person. And we, we, we picked you out of everybody oh in the United States. We said, that's our guy. It's that's just, it. It's terrifying. We have 370 <laughs> million choices and that's the one. <laughs> All right, let's talk about, let's, let's talk about QED. Gears. Let's talk about QED. Let's talk about something that might not, might be a lot. <laughs> and it's gotta be a lot of fun. 
Tell us about this year's this year's QED. Is the first time back, like you said before, it's first time back in a while. So what's planned? Well, we have got, uh, I'm so excited for our lineup this year. And this is my first year on the organizing committee. So I'm so, like, this has been the event that I am, I, I live for. It's my favorite event of the year. I love going to, and now I get to be part of the organizing committee and, oh, and help give ideas for, for speakers. So we've got some great speakers. We've got the GAM guys coming to do a God Awful Movies um, uh, episode live on the main stage, uh, which will be amazing. Um, we've got... Professor Chris Jackson, who is a geologist, who's going to come and talk to us. He's done like the Christmas science lectures in the UK. So like, that's, that means you're a big deal. Um, if, you're <laughs> on the, if you're on the Royal Society Christmas lectures, you're a big deal um, in the UK. <laughs> We've got Aaron Rabinowitz from um, Embrace the Void is doing yeah. oh, that's a great. panel for us, which is really exciting um, alongside a few other people. So we've got what boring Rachel thing Shreya. is Aaron going to talk about? What boring thing is Aaron going to talk about? You know? <laughs> we've, I'm we've, teasing. What, the, the nature of bullshit, the, <laughs> an academic exploration of the... Yeah. <laughs> We've got this exciting panel um, on conspiracy theories, basically, oh, nice. um, which has got um, Aaron Rabinowitz on, Michael Marshall is oh, on that. So um, We've got Rachel Schreyer from the BBC's disinformation team on health. Um, it's going to be an amazing panel. I can't remember. There's somebody else on that panel who I now can't remember, um, but that's that's going to be that amazing. Sounds, that sounds um, awesome. That sounds amazing. <laughs> We've got to do conspiracy theories, right? Yeah, QED. absolutely. Uh, um, we've got Azra Raza from the US who's coming to talk about cancer. Um, Fern Riddell, who is a historian here in the UK, she talks about um, suffrage and the history of sex and sex toys and nice. things like that. That'd be really cool. Um, yeah, it's going to be amazing. I'm super excited. Are you are now? I thought I heard a rumor that the Skeptics with a K group is going to do a live show there. Is that true? We are. So there'll oh. be a Skeptics with a K live show. There will also be an incredulous, incredulous live oh, show. Oh, no, that's um, so nice. Since the last uh, Q &A. Last Q &A must have been the last episode. <laughs> hey, yeah. You know, you got to dust it off once in a while. And he's furiously so. writing his questions now. He's like, I've only had like three years to do. Okay. <laughs> think about it. QED9. Are, only? Incredulous nice. episode nine is going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so serious inquiries only. Thomas Smith's going to be there doing a show. That's good. Yeah. That's great. Oh, that's awesome. Siri, yeah. that's very Thomas great. And Lindsay Osterman. So that'll be that'll be brilliant. We've got we've got a bunch of great stuff. Oh, we've got somebody called Emma Sullivan Bissett who talks about. Uh, in fact, she's the other person on the conspiracy panel. She um, is going to be talking about aliens and type of things oh. like that. But she also she re researches why people believe all sorts of odd beliefs. So um, I think she's going to be brilliant for for that panel as well. It's. It's a great lineup. I'm the so last, excited. That's the last terrific. time I was there, I had my booklet and I had put so many check marks and stuff I wanted to go. There's no way you could go to everything because there's stuff up against overlap, one another. Yeah. There's overlap. So you just can't do it all. But the programming that yeah. you guys put on is just amazing. And I'm so excited for you guys. Can you tell people if they were going to try to get tickets or if they're going to try to travel there? Can you tell them a little information about that? Yeah. So it's in Manchester at the Piccadilly Hotel the weekend of the 28th of October, 28th, 29th and 30th of October. Um, we've got like a Skeptic Camp event being hosted by the Skeptics in the Pub Online crowd doing that's a free event on the Friday as well, which is great. You can get tickets and they're £120 or £80 if you're a student and you can get them from qdcon.org. Alice, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so happy you could you could make it onto the show. We look forward to hopefully having you again. If anything blows Definitely. up in Britain, we're going to send you a message. And we're gonna be like, you got to come back <laughs> on and talk about it. You got to talk with us again. Thank you so Thanks much for coming. Thanks so much for thank having you. me. Thank you.